these matters that are before Jacob. So what we have noticed politically is that Apnu is getting a bit more desperate um, on the ground and in their actions. I think in their internal assessment based on their polling results and based on the lack of enthusiasm for their activities across Guyana, given their dismal performance in office on every count you can think of, that they are aware that a defeat is staring them at the next general elections. And therefore, you're going to see their level of desperation being matched by a set of desperate activities. And so the latest is their assessment of the claims and objection period. In many areas that APNU did extremely well in the past, people have absolutely no enthusiasm for transfers or registration. And I'm aware that when they go to people's home now, people say to them, the, the, the activists of that, that party or the group of parties aligned together, uh, where were you all along? You just need us once again. So they're faced with this and therefore they're aware of the situation. So what, what have, like, they're very creative now. So they have loudhalers going around parts of the country saying, go and get registered. That's the only way you can collect your share of the oil money. And that's, that's the new level of desperation. And secondly, that's the only way you will get a national identification card. We have heard this in many places. I got some people to tape it. And the second issue, the, the, another manifestation of this desperation and a recognition that it would be difficult to rig the elections given international scrutiny, given polling the activities that we intend to participate in with their, our toughest polling agents to ensure that there is no shenanigan on, shenanigan on that day, that they're attempting to either disenfranchise people, large swathes of people, hoping it would change the electoral arithmetic, or creating, and I think the second is more likely, creating the basis for a legal challenge after the elections. Knowing that a very potent area or a very an area that has already seen an election overturn in the past has been the area of the use of a national identification for voting. So, and, and I'm talking about Claudette Singh's ruling in the past when she vitiated the elections on the basis of the voters' ID. It was not a requirement for people to vote. So, I believe that what you see from our new commissioners now is the preparation of the ground. They have their, their instructions from Congress space try as much as possible to disenfranchise people within the GCOM machinery, but that will be difficult to do. Uh, failing which, prepare the grounds for a, a legal challenge after the elections. And so this is the latest manifestation of these acts of desperation. The proposal by the APNU commissioners to strike off the name of the voters from the national, um, from the OLE, the official list of electors, if they do not pick up their ID cards. 
Now this is patently illegal. Illegal. And I will take you through the issue. So we heard the justification for this. Um, and from the Chronicle, um, the Chronicle article, I think October 30th, says that at a previous meeting, Commissioner Vincent Alexander had explained it's like an objection. So the issue is not their ID card, the issue that these persons, since 2008 and beyond 2008, have not in any way presented themselves to be present to be known, to be alive, to be existing, and to be resident. And in calling them, writing to them gives us the opportunity to make a determination. Now, if you have to file an objection, you can do so in the claims and objection period. Why doesn't APNU file an objection to people's names? That would be a legal route to take. If they want, they have the remaining period, uh, almost 10 days, over 10 days, to file objections. They have so far filed less than 100 objections to people's names. But Vincent Alexander wants to remove them through a backdoor illegal process rather than going through the statutory process of filing objections to names on the list. If you file an objection, that means GCOM is required to follow a process and if and the process can result in the person being removed from the voters list. But you cannot file an objection on the basis that the person, you can't find the person or the person is not resident in Guyana because the Chief Justice has already ruled on that issue. So it is a backdoor illegal way of addressing this issue. So that is Vincent Alexander, his justification for doing this. So he wants GCOM illegally to do the work of the APNU. Secondly, um, I saw Mr. Corbyn saying, it's also informed the media that the names of these individuals will not be removed from the National Register of Registrants, stating it would only mean that if these persons exist, they may miss this round of elections. Can you imagine a commissioner saying that these people, if they don't pick up their ID, but they exist and they don't need an ID to vote, they will miss this round of elections. Their names would be on the NRR, but you can't vote. They, luckily in Guyana, we have laws and the constitution and elections are governed by statute, by laws, and not the whims and fancies of people like Mr. Corbyn to tell people you will lose your right to vote because, or you have to set out these elections, boy, because we, you didn't pick up your ID card and we couldn't find you. This is effectively what he is, he is saying. So, clearly, this decision is illegal, an illegal one. So let us look at a couple of issues, the whole issue of ID cards. These are national identification cards. They are, they are not voters identification card. You don't need them to vote. You can vote without an ID. So in the past, these cards were issued by the Ministry of Home Affairs the national ID card and then at some time it was decided that GCOM should perform that function for the state since it was now responsible for registration and the NRR. 
So GCOM should issue national identification cards, not for the purpose of voting, but because Guyanese above 14 years can get a national ID card for multiple use in the, in the society. It has no direct relationship to your presence on the voters list or you voting. In fact, that has been ruled upon already. You don't need it to vote. And so that function, trying to link the two, your collection of an ID card to losing your right to vote is an affront to Guyana, to Guyanese. It's illegal and we will never allow it to stand. And all of those people who say that they believe that, you know, they, they hold the right to vote sacred, all of these parties, the small parties and civil society, I hope they stand up on this one. And you remember Mr. Granger saying that he wanted credible elections and he wanted, he was very worried that young people will not get a chance to register. Well, his commissioners are trying to illegally deny people who are on the list who don't need an ID card to vote. If they don't have an ID card, they don't pick up an ID card from GCOM, that they will, get, they will lose their right to vote. And he talks about credible elections. I hope we'll hear from him on this matter. I hope we'll hear from him on this matter. So, the Constitution of Guyana, I would urge you to look at Article 159 and 59 of Article 59 of the Constitution of Guyana. It says in 59, subject to the provisions of Article 159, every person may vote at an election if he or she is of the age 18 years or upwards and is either a citizen of Guyana or a Commonwealth citizen, domicile and resident in Guyana. So the only requirement to vote is Guyanese 18 years and above. They had removed the last constitution before it was amended had residency. You had to be resident. The Chief Justice has ruled on that. That was removed. So that is the only qualification you need to exercise the right to vote, to have the right to vote as a Guyanese. Nowhere does it mention remotely anything like ID card. So they cannot remove, they cannot. It would be an illegal act. And to, they, if they were to remove people's names from the official list of electors because they did not pick up their ID card. In fact, this matter was in the public domain sometime in the past. And um, it is when in 2011, Mr. Serge Bali was asked the same question. And this is what he said in June 16, 2011 report. When 43,187 cards were still not correct, collected, um, he stressed that these are not voting cards and pointed out that the constitutional requirement to vote is to be registered, not necessarily to be in possession of an identification card. This matter was dealt with in the past by GCOM. It's in the newspapers here. And at that time, 43,000 people did not pick up their ID cards. Now it's 28,000. But they didn't lose the right to vote, which is a sacred, sacred right. And the Chief Justice herself, in her ruling, recent ruling, pointed out um, in 121 of the ruling and section, the right to be registered to vote and the right to vote are sacrosanct and fundamental. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to which Guyana has acceded and which is incorporated into our Constitution 
establishes the right to vote as a matter of international human rights law and provides that every citizen has a right to vote. That is the ruling of the Chief Justice recently. She goes on in 130 to mention Justice Claudette Singh's ruling in the Esther Pereira matter. And as you know, the Esther Pereira matter was the two political parties before the 1997 elections agreed that we will use the national identification form at the polling places as the only means to identify voters. After they lost the elections, they went and challenged that agreement that they had with the two, the two, between the two parties. And, and Justice Claudette Singh said, basically, she shortened the term, the PPP's term in office, and, our, and, and ruled that the ID card was not a requirement to vote. That was Claudette Singh's ruling. But she said in, she quoted sections, other rights, even the most basic or illusory, if the right to vote is on the mind. This is from Claudette Singh's ruling. And at 131, the Chief Justice repeats what Claudette Singh said, Justice Singh. It became, becomes clear then that any prohibition, restriction, or limitation on the right to vote must be viewed with a close and critical eye, since any such encroachment would be a bar to that voter's right, that voter's right to have a voice in the elections of his representatives in government. This is Claudette Singh's ruling. This, her decision here, cannot be explained. Her decision to support the APNU proposal to remove people's names from the voters list because they did not pick up their ID card cannot be explained. And I hope that whenever, because she said when decisions are made, I saw her interview with Kaichou News, she said when decisions are made, she will speak with the press. Well, a decision has been made here and we we would like her to explain this decision. Now that a decision has been made by the commission, well, at least from what I'm not even sure that that decision is made because that's what we heard from the commissioners. But when she confirms this, she needs to answer why in this case she wants, to, or she's sided with the three commissioners to, to, in a process that will disenfranchise thousands of Ghanaians and would be illegal if they don't pick up their ID cards which is not a requirement to vote. It's so simple, I don't understand how this decision will ever stand. And, and it's clear. So just assuming you voted, what they're saying, we don't know who these 28,000 people are right now. So what I'm saying here is not for PBB supporters because that's what the Chronicle is trying to spin. The 28,000 Guyanese can lose their jobs, um, not their jobs, but their 30,000 already lost their jobs, but lose their right to vote they were because of GCOM. And these could be APNU supporters, PPP supporters, people who don't, don't support anyone. But the right to vote is fundamental. They have a right to be on that list once they're registered and on the voters list, not on the NRR. So Corbyn wants to keep them on the NRR, but don't extract their names. I don't, I don't understand how we could even do that. That's not legal. So that, that, that's it. So assuming you voted the last elections, you are Guyanese, you voted the last elections, you didn't use your ID card, you didn't pick up your ID card. They're telling you now you lost your right to vote in these elections because you don't go in to pick up your ID card. So you lose your right to vote. You voted in 2015 with your passport or you just took an oath because your picture is there, you take the oath and you voted. You don't pick up your ID card now. You don't get to, you can't vote again in these elections. You lost it, illegal. 
so that is that is unbelievable so so i don't understand so and what about if they can't give the new registrant's id card in time for the elections are they too gonna lose their right to vote are they gonna lose their right to vote too and this thing about publishing their names and writing them now i don't know if you write to, if i'm living in connoisseur how i'll read the newspapers or in a remote Amerindian community in the hinterland, I'd read the newspapers. So you write to, uh, or when the letter would reach them, and then they remove their names. And those people who live in the hinterland would lose their rights to vote, but not just hinterland people, I'm just giving you an example. It's downright illegal, illegal. And this is not gonna stand, because if we allow it in the, what will happen you'll have a new government on march 3rd a new government and then immediately thereafter the same corbyn and vincent alexander they will find another front person as another esther Pereira, and go to the court and argue that oh the people gca made an illegal decision therefore the elections have to be vitiated like what happened in the past that is what the game they're playing at here because they see the writing on the wall and and so we must not allow this to succeed the next the next issue is that you know for a while now in the public domain that we have been discussing international assistance the one positive thing at GCOM is that the commonwealth consultants who will be here full time two of them until the elections um, within gcom and we have seen the cvs of those people from africa one from ghana and one from india these are highly qualified people and hopefully their presence in the machinery at gcom will make a world of difference because we believe the right advice will be given and they can identify any attempts to harm the election. So that's positive. But the, the country already knows, we have discussed hundreds of times, several press conferences that UNDP has offered assistance in the IT department. So they have refused this assistance. I spoke about it last week that on Tuesday, we believe that the decision will be made to move forward because you do need oversight on IT, where the list is being generated, etc. To my surprise, we, the, the commissioners representing the opposition said that they were told at the commission's meeting that they were not aware that UNDP has offered IT help. Imagine that's in the public domain. Everybody knows excepting the people who should know. And I know that they do know. And, and so now another week has gone by <coughs> before the next commission's meeting to just decide if the UNDP has offered <coughs> IT assistance, which they have done. They have done so in in writing, in meetings, etc. Rather than the chair just exiting the meeting and making one call, in five minutes the issue could have been resolved. All they say, can I get in touch with the, re the resident coordinator of the, the program, UN program here? Is there uh, an offer? Because I have confusion here at the commission over this offer. What is it for? The offer could have been there. At that meeting, the decision could have been made. But I suspect this dragging the IT assistance out is to get us past the claims and objection period when a lot of the decisions will be made that could be harmful, like the illegal one that we just spoke of could be made. And so we're going to be vigilant, but this represents 
by the leadership. It, it, the decision could have been made the, right there and, and uh, put an end to that matter. The third, the third issue that um, I want to address at GCOM is this whole thing about the margin. So what we have what we have discovered is that we have had a look at the house the house list that was posted. There are lots of errors on this list. Lots of errors. <coughs> Spelling errors, errors in the names, addresses, occupation of people. There are two lists. Um, those who are 14 to 18 and those who are 18 and above. So clearly these can be lists published for claims and objections because you would not publish a list of 14 to 18 year old for claims and objections to get on the voters list. So there's confusion around why that list of 14 to 18 year old was published. Secondly, the commissioners are not any clearer, leaving us as ordinary citizens to just guess the purpose of the publication of this list because the commissioners themselves are not even clear about how the process, the list, fits into the legal architecture. There's been no order putting out this list as a supplemental list to the PLE. And we argue that it cannot be supplemental because it is a duplicate list. It has names that are already on the PLE. Supplemental list by its very implication must be in addition to. So we don't know if uh, there we saw a statement coming from the PRO that people must check their names on the house to house list, but that's 370,000 people. And after now go there to check their names, who may have already checked their names on the PLE, which is the legal process they should have gone through. So if they attempt to merge this data later with or replace the data on the PLE with this data, we'll be in big trouble because all the spelling errors, mistakes, addresses, etc., will be a huge problem. And there are many people that we still can't find up to now who they claim live in certain areas, but we're not finding them on the list so that even the padding will go across there so we are we're still in the dark because the commission has just thrown these lists out there there's no statutory underpinning to the list there is no clear direction what to do so my our, my point up to now is to say to people if you had registered on the house the house process get re-registered Go back and get your transfers done or your registration if you're a new registrant. Do that. And, and we, because this is and this is the only legal process through which you can do this. That is the claims and objection period. That is why the People's Progressive Party is now urging people to do that now. I saw Gordon Mosley said. Jagger was telling people not to register in the past and now he's telling them to register. We were saying to them, do not register in the illegal house-to-house -house activity that was prematurely brought to an end because we were right. It was illegal. They had, that's why they had to stop it. And they were trying to get that data gathered illegally there through the back door into this process. You cannot do that. 
So please go out if you don't say, oh, I registered already in the house to house process and I don't need to get registered again. Go out if you're registered through that process. You have a few remaining days, get registered now. The right to vote is sacred. But right now we're in the dark and we're coming to the end of the exercise soon and with no clarity again. So so this is this is very troubling. This is very troubling. Um, and we will keep on top of it. And that's what I want to assure people. The reason we are highlighting, as I say every week, that we are highlighting these issues is because, um, because we want people to know that we are going to be very, very vigilant to ensure that there is no rigging of the elections and two, that they do not do things that are outside of the law, which could lead to an elections petition challenging the results of the elections after, because we believe that's their aim to try to get some of these things done illegally. Um, something we rarely been hearing from the president because um, he, he hardly makes time for the media. And so it was interesting to hear from him and he chose appropriately the conduit was Gordon Mosley to give this interview, a long interview with Mosley. I suspect that was, was done because he knew that Mosley will not test him on the troubling issues that he has to answer. So the questions must have been shared and planned. So take for example, a, an issue like a leading question. I just wanna go to get into the mindset because the mindset of a president is very important to voters. And we've always argued that this president not, is not just aloof, he's uninformed, he's unbothered, he doesn't take responsibility for anything, he lives in this fairy tale land where he believes because he says something that that's the reality on the ground. Oh, the jobs are being created and jobs will be created. People are enjoying the good life now. We're fighting corruption, that sort of thing. He, he lives in that dream world. And this is, spells disaster for our country. And we have always art, argued that he's been unable to articulate a vision for this country and a plan consistent with that vision and this interview just reinforces all that we have said if you watch it carefully and analyze it through those perspectives what precisely has he said the future holds for Guyana if not the same level of incompetence corruption that his administration now offers what precisely came out of that interview. So, he, God Moses says to him, does the constitution say the president shall appoint a PM? Therefore, in your estimation, your understanding, the presidential candidate should be allowed to choose the PM. Now, God Moses knows that the constitution does say that you, the president appoints the prime minister and then whole cabinet. You don't need to ask a question like that. The qu other question is that as part of a coalition, do you believe that you, uh, you should unilaterally make the decision on the prime ministerial candidate if you're part of a coalition? That should have been the question, not whether 
you have a right to, according to the constitution to appoint the prime minister. Everybody knows that. How had the white how had he identified Nagamotu in the past? And so he says he has to listen to all the members of his coalition. And one thing is absent from his entire interview. He just, he says, I have to listen to my people and the people he's talking about is this corrupt, incompetent cabal. Nowhere about listening to Guyanese, what they want, what their desires are, etc. That's the thing that struck me most about the interview, that he believes that he has to satisfy the desire of this circle. So even when asked, he said, I can't bring in, I don't want a cabinet with technocrats who don't know people. But you do need technocrats who can who know people, competent people, and you do have. And I think even APNU has. We have some, and APNU has some. It's just they've now been given an opportunity. Uh, uh, so, so it is all a defense of the system, the circle, this cabal. And so he says he is looking for what he is looking for in his candidates for the upcoming elections for ministerial position and for the prime ministership. He says people of Guyana must be satisfied that their ministers are honest, unbribable. Imagine this president saying that and then he defends his current ministers as being honest and unbribable. We have pointed out scandal after scandal involving ministers. One minister who has been giving contracts to herself, to her own company in her ministry, leaving out other ministries. Uh, another minister who has given out contracts to her husband. Um, minister, another minister who has taken large swathes of mining land. Um, the contract of another minister who has 9,000 US dollars paid into his account by Chinese company that he can't explain. Uh, we give a long list of, of things to him. <clears throat> 600 million missing from one project. The Volder Lawrence scandals with the uh, procurement in, in the health sector. And he still lives this myth that people believe that they're unbribable and there is no corruption. This is the most corrupt government in our entire history, proven so. We tried to file five private criminal charges against five ministers and we would have succeeded with conviction, getting them convicted because we have evidence <coughs> to their, their illegalities. They remember they argued that we were corrupt, we would all be thrown in jail. They, they've had they scoured the entire landscape, audits, etc. And a, a few frivolous charges filed. And we from opposition could have done that until the Attorney General said he intervened with the DPP, which is in itself illegal, and he prevailed upon her to, to get the charges brought. So we couldn't pursue those charges. So. The president, he, he, he says this. Then about his program, he said, why is there a need for change? We're, we're doing great job. I want continuity. We're batting on a good wicket. Why do we want to have technocrats in our cabinet? He asked, when the, he said, when, are you disappointed in your ministers? Gordon Mosley asked him. He said, no, 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 we're great. We're batting on a great wicket. The, the wicket that he's batting on is one that have, has lost us 30,000 jobs, one that has seen a hundred billion in taxes increase, a massive large scale corruption, a giveaway of our national patrimony in the oil sector, daily acts of corruption. He even sells these cabinet outreaches, which are acts of corruption, the outreaches, as a virtue and we must be grateful for these and how they are solving 
people's problem through these outreaches. These outreaches only started taking place after the, the no confidence vote and they had to go back to elections. And many of them are going to say, vote for us now, we will promise you a better life again in the future. That is what the outreach is have not delivered any, any anything. He says that there is a powerhouse called David Granger, and that he works the, his achievements are done quietly. They're so so quiet that he, we can't see them, we can't hear them. They've been in, only in his mind, in his silent moments, etc. That's the achievements because. I'm not seeing anything, so it is like fictional uh, here. Uh, it's it's an interesting to interview to read. I he says I don't like a big cabinet. He moved the cabinet from <laughs> the ministers from 17 to 27 or something like that. We have ministers pouring out of our ears everywhere else. He says I don't like a big cabinet. He says. Um, teachers were getting $32,000 in 2015 and now they're getting $60,000. This is a factual error. Teachers were not getting $32,000 a month in 2015, nor did they get 60, are they getting $60,000 now. He's implying he is double teacher's salary. That's what he's implying. He has the numbers wrong and the, the ratio wrong, the percentage increase wrong. Totally. Imagine a president who doesn't even know that. Well, a child would know that no teacher was getting $32,000 in 2015 and they're getting $60,000. He says uh, pensioners were getting $7,500 and now they're getting $20,000. That's a lie too. Another lie. And this is an interview by a president on national television with a sympathetic interviewer. God, most we should have said, which world are you living in? How, uh, you don't know these numbers? This is a total, not true. It's a blatant lie. If you can't know these things, you then think you've made progress. By his standards, he's increased pension by 130%. When you had about a $3,000 increase in the pension. That's what he's saying. And, and so, he said, many people are happy with the, his policies across Guyana and he get cards thanking him for these policies. <laughs> well, I used to get a lot of cards to as president and thanking you, but let me give one word of advice. There are a lot of psychophants around you and people, yes men and all that stuff when you're president. And if he listens to his ministers and all of these people who hang around all day, then you always have a class that likes to hang around people there. And they tell you the greatest things about yourself. So get get back grounded, Mr. Granger. Go on the ground. People are not happy. They're losing jobs. They're children, they can't send their kids to school. He talks about his one bus he gave to Kanji. He gave a bus to in Kanji and took away all the jobs from the people in Kanji, the sugar estate. This is, and ministers are doing a wonderful job. And then asked, shouldn't you have done more? Shouldn't you have done more? He said, um, the country is bigger than England and Scotland together. So it, it got bigger after the PPP left office because we weren't doing enough. But after the PVP left office, the Guyana grew bigger than Scotland and England together. So suddenly he can't do enough, you know, because the country too big. This is the kind of thing. Um, crime, he says, every when they ask about crime and investigating what he said, that how all the rumors that they spread about us, killing young black kids and all of that stuff. They had all the evidence in the past. They were not convict people. He, he said, we can't find evidence. No, we can't find evidence. It's rumors. You can't find evidence because a lot of the people that you put on the list are policemen who were killed by the bandits. You're not going to find evidence of 
PPP doing anything there. They were victims of bandits. Some of them are alive. And that sort of thing. And, and so this is, you will not find evidence. And your rumors about corruption, that is the reason why we are not finding evidence. Because between 2011 to 2015, you think the PPP was stealing the whole of Guyana. 28 billion to 35 billion a year missing and all that sort of stuff. We now know, you should check the audit report, how, how many billions are missing now, because when we point out where, they can't up to now point out where these billions are missing from. So that's why it, you're not finding the evidence, because you were spreading, you, they, they sung a good song. They had a good song about corruption, and you know it was look they would throw people in jail and all of that and therefore it was very potent uh, the supporters bought into it. now to prove it is something else and the most troubling thing about his entire discussion on crime you know he, whilst crime is ravaging the country and it's upturning people's lives on a daily basis he has not outlined any measure the, to, to arrest this situation. You know what he says? Two things he says. Oh, I have a report from a British consultant now. And I have four deputy commissioners who were not there before. That's his two explanations on the whole crime, how he's addressing crime. I've reformed the police. I have four deputy commissioners and I have a report from somebody from England. This is another evidence of him being aloof. And now you would want to think that a president, when asked the first one of his first interviews that he's doing in depth interview, would want to define his vision for the oil and gas sector. He guess what he spoke about? A sovereign wealth fund that was passed after the No Confidence Motion, the Natural Resources Fund, that is dominated by the executive president and would have to be repealed and upgrade, changed. And then he talks about the Department of Energy. These were the two things he all he had to say. Not anything about local content. How Guyanese will benefit from the sector. Here, he hasn't spoken about protecting Guyanese workers, like those who are working now and are getting, they call, they're Guyanese, they get a tiny pay, the foreigners are getting a huge pay for the same job that they are doing and stuff like that. Nothing about that definition of it. I would urge, well, I wouldn't urge you to look at it, you're wasting your time, but, but really it's a classic case of a speech that reinforces every single thing that we have said about this president and his government. Useless, incompetent, corrupt, visionless, has not, no plan for Guyana. They, I just want to see, I see the rhetoric here on strange thing from Congress, please a press statement which says, um, united we stand a better chance to fulfill our destiny. Of course, that's true. But coming from Congress, please. And then it says in one paragraph, um, the P present P political climate creates an opportunity for cooperation and consultation. But unfortunately, the PPP in the person of Mr. Barajagio is not interested. The Constitution clearly at Article 1067 leaves open the door for legislative dialogue, but Mr. Jagger had chosen to shut that door. The question must be asked, why is the PPP bent on confrontation and collision? Imagine them saying this. Now they're talking about well, talks in the, in the Parliament. But you have had a Parliament. We've moved from a parliamentary democracy by, to rule by decree. This happens in dictatorship. No parliamentary system in the world would have world would have in almost a year only three sittings. And and the sittings are almost illegal. Because from December twenty first, 
last year till now, there's been no legislative agenda for the country. This is a, a huge thing in a, we have a parliamentary system and you have a non-functioning parliament because why they have decided to drag out the whole issue of the no confidence motion and holding elections abusing it and ruling by decree basically so you have almost a, over a year now up to march 21st when the parliament of Guyana has not functioned and this is in a parliamentary democracy where this is an equal branch of the government and then the other branch of the government also for two years now we don't have a judicial service commission so you have three branches of the government the parliamentary branch the legislative branch not functioning the, the judicial branch two years now no JSC which is the governing body and then the executive branch dysfunctional and illegal that is the state of Ghana they've taken us almost to a failed state type of status so <clears throat> then they talk about legislative dialogue in in in, in this regard I just want to uh, say that it's interesting how the, the constitution, deceit and treachery always comes back to, always come back to haunt you. Deceit and treachery come back to haunt you. And so when Granger illegally appointed Mr. Patterson, he, the AFC applauded it. In fact, they use that illegal act as their campaign slogan for the local government elections, fit and proper. They applauded it, they are gleeful, they are joyful, you know. Now Granger is quoting the same constitution. I can't agree to your prime ministerial candidate because the constitution does not allow me to. As president, I, I choose. So in a way, I'm tempted to say good for you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? Because when you, all your principles and all of that stuff, these lofty principles that they used to talk about, came back to haunt them, bite them in the ass. So, so, so that is this thing, and you would see them, or you know, they go and talk about constitutional change and, um, campaign financing and present themselves as upright citizens and they were all along party to the illegality and, and the fraud perpetrated on the people of this country they're party to it on a daily basis the, the, tra the trauma that they put people through and, uh, and they continue at GCA to put people through they're all party to it, the GCA, um, AFNU and AFC so it was almost like a, a good good moment for me but at the end of the day trust me they will in spite of all of this and trotman speaks for apnu trotman and nagamutu are now part of the apnu cabal they're no longer afc so at the end of the day they will get together and the only thing that will keep them together is corruption and the perks of office which is what they're doing now they're sharing the perks of office that's why you have this big fight they want to share the perks of office so that will keep them together so don't worry too much at the end of the day you're right they will get together on that basis and even if they don't agree to Ramjetan don't worry with Dominic Gaskin he will never tell his father no to um to that they like that it's non-negotiable. He said, they said at the press conference, the issue of the prime ministerial candidate is non-negotiable. That's what they said. So let's, I, but I don't have any faith in them keeping their word or as people of principle. So let's see what goes on. And I'm pleased to see that um, also they, Imran Khan 
the famous propagandists and ball propagandists of the the afternoon that in one columnist columnist um, in the Kaicho News said that he released something after their press conference to see that the process of selecting the prime ministerial candidate in the AFC was rigged and that Ram Jatan plied the people with gifts you know another one is accustomed to the largest you remember who's the largest man Nagamutu he is the largest one a contractor the man who got the bond accused him of collecting largest from him the drug bond well apparently Ram Jatan plied according to Imran Khan plied the delegates with gifts and the process of selection of their prime ministerial candidate was not democratic so i hope that the same issues and that too will um will come back to 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 haunt them in the future in fact it is something that i remember also about the same Ramjatan talking about the PPP, how we don't have a democratic process for selecting, at least our process is clear, where the nominations come from, who decides and all of that. So he used to talk a lot about that, but apparently he has, um, he has not, not been democratically selected. And so, um, the last thing is on GCOM I mentioned is that I saw they're going to go to the, the media monitoring unit um, at GCOM and uh, we support international presence in the media monitoring unit and we also what we hope that they will look take a close look at the state media because they will have international presence there from what I gather GCOM has accepted that and then the state media I will I will um, speak with the governor staff a, a special look at the state media about how fairly they treat the BBB they love the BBB in the state media so um, I just end there thank you uh, by the way this GPEX thing I saw this corrupt activity if they're planning to go ahead with the corrupt activity well trying to and press conference hosted by the Department of Energy with the individuals there who are trying to shake down Guyana and Guyanese and local business community. Forget the rich ones who think they can make a, a deal there, they will go there, pay their 2,000 US. But they don't have a right to define. They don't have a right to define any policy on Guyana. The foreigners can't do that we the Ghanaians must define the future of the oil and gas uh, industry here in Guyana by ourselves not allow the foreigners to do it so we will continue to watch out for this activity thank you yes and then you Good afternoon, Mr. Jagger, Chairman, Mr. Jagger, Mr. Jagger. You mentioned that the decision by GCOM to uh, well, my Muslim asked persons to come in. For course, who are not updated, I I think I do so, um, barring which they may not be able to vote. So that that can't stand. Is that an indication that if you be uh, intend to challenge this decision, if it is confirmed by the chair, the chairperson, to challenge this decision in court? Um, we have to look into this because I'm, I'm hoping that once they have a clear look at the laws, then you're going to, um, that the decision will have to be recommitted for discussion at the level of the commission. I'm, I'm hoping to avoid the courts. We're hoping to avoid the courts, but the courts can meet. I remember on matters in Beijing for elections, the CCJ in a Barbados case, when it had to do with urgency, they met over the weekend and gave their ruling within two three days so when you have matters of that nature then you should have the courts act with alacrity and so i am sure and there is nowhere in the world that the, 
the high the courts will disenfranchise Ghanaians because they don't pick up their ID card and the ID card is not voters card you don't need it to vote and you lose your right to vote a fundamental right because I don't collect my ID card but assuming they don't look at the laws and it could it could it could very well it could very well end up there okay. could very well I can't confirm that option at this stage but it could very well um, end up in court. Second question, you said that it seems as the government is using this as an attempt to use it after elections perhaps to try to invalidate the election which went before. Now, couldn't this, couldn't that, assuming that, that is the intention, act as a double-edged sword, allowing the opposition, assuming you do not win the elections, to use that same ground to invalidate a win by the government? But that's why we don't want it. It's illegal. That's why we don't want it. Take it away from everybody. It's you are clear on the law and the constitution. Stick with the constitution, not Corbyn's interpretation. We didn't propose this. Corbyn proposed this. Apnu proposed this. We uh, we don't support it. We don't support taking people's votes away. You can you can be challenged for taking someone's right to vote. You can't be challenged for retaining their right to vote. But one can say that the PPP refused to send scrutineers to house to house for the same reason, can't they? No, 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 but that's a separate matter. I'm talking about the use of the ID card. Let's let's stick with this ID card. You were talking about... So they, that we refused to send because we were proven correct. Remember the Chief Justice ruled and GCOM on its own, this chair, stopped the exercise. So she stopped the exercise. If it was perfectly legitimate, they would have continued to its conclusion. You were talking they, about attempting to invalidate the election. Yes, so that is why we said we will not participate in an illegal act. Therefore, for removing people's name from the list, which it was the purpose of the House Downs exercise. The purpose was to replace the NRR, which would have replaced people that they couldn't find, but there was no residency requirement. So we went to the court and the court ruling, we live with the court ruling, so court ruled on that. And then that was the thing. We want to stick with the law. We want to stick with the constitution, not one commissioner waking up one morning and saying, oh no, I think this is a good thing, or getting instructions from the party. On that point, on that point um, given that this current chairman made a decision that he gave in the case which went before, um, what do you make of her decision to support, assuming that she has an, and I can kind of assume that she has supported the decision to now remove persons on the basis of um, non of well, that is precisely why I would, we are, are asking that the decision be explained. Now, there's one thing here. I see the newspaper saying, Justice God, it's in rule. She's not sitting there as a judge. So that's very different than in the past. Justice Singh sits there as chair of GCOM. When you're a judge, you rule. When you when you were um, a part of a commission, you and that you, the judge you make all the decisions on the basis of your understanding of things. When you're part of a commission, a chairman of GCOM, you have to understand the intricacies there. We have seen several attempts to go outside of the law. Several, I can document them again, but I don't want to belabor the points that came out through the press releases in the past. And we, we have gone through this in the last month or two. So she has to be cognizant that people will try to get her to take sides. So she has to get the broadest range of advice and then operate on what is legal. So that's one, so she doesn't rule. Two, her decisions now are challengeable in court, just visible. When she was judge, the decision was not, that's a ruling. But sir, are you at all, is your party at all concerned 
that um, challenging GCOM may further delay the election. No, but I, that is why I did not say like, no. But you were. I was pointing out all the illegalities. Yes, my point is that you heard what I I just said. I said that could always be an option, but we have not decided. I am, I am, I think by the weight of the public opinion alone, illegal. And with the chair of GCOM explaining her decision, why in this case she supported the people losing their right to vote if they did not pick up an ID card when she had a ruling the superior matter when it's clearly uh, the the people that for the chairs before her never did that never did that so she has to explain to people when we see that explanation then we'll make a decision but right now I'm just saying the mindset sometimes and that the decisions could be challengeable too not and and so right now we are calling on the chair to explain the decisions that's all we're saying be available to the press answer the concerns of Ghanaians explain to them clearly why this will not take away their right to vote how if I did not pick up my ID card how am I gonna lose my right to vote that's one under what law or constitution secondly how are they going to use this house to house data explain to us because we are in the dark we are a stakeholder the commissioner said there and they're in the dark we should be knowing this the leadership not just of the pvp but all the political parties we're in the dark much less the public and so, that's all we are asking explain explain the decision sir this is about the second or third week now that uh, new phoenix um, pointing out um, issues with the chairman is your confidence in the chairman of must ask if it's win no i i we have a lot of unexplained decision so that is why i'm urging i want to hear the explanations i would like to hear the explanations for the questions that we posed but I can't get that my there at the meeting. I'm not there. So I'm asking that through the media that the chair makes herself available. She said she will when the decisions are made. A decision has been made. Tell us. So uh, say, uh, why wasn't it done ever before? That's the first question. Like no other chair did that. You're clear where, where other chairs said it would we had large numbers of ID that were not picked up, but people can't lose their right to vote. The ruling of the Chief, Chief Justice, her own ruling, the Constitution, how does this fly in all of this? And commonsensical, the man who lives in, in um, say, say the Palm Room, if he doesn't pick up his ID card, why should he not vote, but he voted the last elections? He could go with his passport and vote. Sir. Right, so those answers, that's what we are craving at. Follow up, follow up. No, please, yeah. Sir, sir, will, will your party then consider um, convening a meeting with the chairman and our commissioners? We, we so did that. Uh, so we did. That we've pointed out lately. We will probably do that to seek the answers. but. I don't think we alone should get the answers in the PPP. APNU should get the same answers too. The public should know. What about people across this country? They must hear about these decisions. Because this election doesn't belong to the PPP or APNU. It belongs to the people of the country. They have a right to hear that they, about this. That, that's why I'm saying it can be done only in a closed doors environment and then i go there and i come out and misrepresent what i said again mm -hmm. no 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 but i'm just using it hypothetically because we see that every week coming out that 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 is why clear answers to all of these questions because if a single one can be answered and a single one of these things is illegal that could like in in the past cause the whole elections to be 
the course. My final question is yes. um, Sure, yes, no, go ahead. Sir, on the issue of the oil and gas, um, we've now seen that the deal for production is moving forward to December. You did indicate that um, we would like to play a role in the management of the oil and gas at the And recently we had Minister Trotman saying that um, the door is open to the party for government because the sector cannot be managed by this one course of the party. Um, are you prepared? So, first of all, we've been advocating for four years now a bipartisan approach to it. The, this is, I think, Trotman had a epiphany when the, his connection to Valiant was revealed. And so suddenly he wants a bipartisan approach to the matter. But prior to that, if you hear our speeches, you talk about, listen to parliament, our speeches in parliament, we promoted a bipartisan, a national position. That's part of our manifesto, that's one. Two, that ExxonMobil, uh, um, we said, we made it clear to ExxonMobil, and I recently had a meeting with them, and I said, what, we don't want the timetable for production to be affected. If you can start producing oil in November or June next year, whenever the vessel is ready to pump the oil, go ahead. We are not talking about timetable based on the timing for elections because that's production. And however, none of the resources, and this is clear from Eden Jordan, could be used before the elections because there's no budget. There will be no budget. The money has to be escrowed, placed in an account, properly guarded too, you know, knowing, <laughs> knowing that some of these guys properly guarded until after the elections. And they, we have already made it clear, we are not participating in an architecture that is illegally passed so the natural resources fund was illegally established it was established after the no confidence motion you have heard me argue that the government the politicians have too much control over the natural resources fund that we intend to repeal that bill that's so, the yes the natural resources fund that's what it's called in guyana in guyana sovereign wealth fund is a generic name for all around the world but in Ghana's case the name is natural resources fund in another country it could be called a heritage fund but the that's a generic name sovereign wealth funds so 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 the thing is um so that's that's what we are we argue that we will repeal we'll pass a new architecture the new architecture will have a more arm's length relationship from the politician it will be more bipartisan and then we'll set up the architecture for that. There is no need to, to, to do that now. And I have no confidence that if they set up anything, that it would not, it would be favorable to Guyanese. This group here, and from the Department of Energy or wherever, Trotman, they're too compromised to set up anything to benefit our people. So it's best that they produce the oil and they escrow the resources. And then the, after the elections, all of this will be settled. So the election is right. started. No, let me just not anymore. Let me go back. Right. Like, yeah, I didn't. So um, I have a few questions about this but I still want to go back to the second G now. Um, you said you need an explanation. Yes. I understand that this is for the benefit of the public. However, what I want to get clear is there some kind of breakdown at the level of the meeting? Where you cannot get an explanation from your commissioners as to why the chairman would have made the decision that she made. Could they give you any reason they, that she uh, would have offered? No. The commissioner, I think, representing the opposition, spoke to, to the media, and I think he did an interview. And they are in the dark about the house to house. They're in two, about the point, but they're in the yes. So there was no that is why when it mentions rule if the chair rules then that that presupposes like both sides make a submission but it's not a court of law and therefore 
dare not they raise the issue of illegality and all of that inconsistencies but no explanation so this is why when the chair comes to the public domain the media could say what about your decision what about the constitution why should i lose my vote you know because i didn't pick up a document that is not a voter's card it's a national id that is not for elections the national id is for multiple use good so that same point you made um that's this difference that i don't understand what is the reference to the S Pereira case? Because in that case, there was a ruling as to the use of the national, of the voter's identification card, not the national ID card, which are separate. But, now but that's even to... worse. That's even worse now because <laughs> the voter's ID card was the national, so was the ID, the was the ID, yes. But this here, there's no so even worse now at least at that time the two parties got together and said we will have a card which is the a national id but this only with that you will vote and so it was considered like the voters id now it's even worse you don't need an, a, an id the national id to go and vote the connection to a national identification card which is for use at the bank for any transactions, GRA, etc., has nothing to do with your right to vote. So if I don't pick this one up, how do I lose my right to vote here? When this one has nothing to do with my the right to vote, it's it's unbelievable that a decision of this sort would be made. I this here has no connection to my right, which is a fundamental constitutional right. And I don't pick up this card. Many people you know, don't even pick it up. They have a passport, they don't worry about it. That's illegal. That is. Okay, and on the issue about the oil, I know you said you don't want the timeline to be altered because of the election. But in the interim, the president's government would have to set up an agreement, the sale agreement, etc. How confident are you that these things that you want to continue at this time will? that is that is the worry and that's why we said no long-term contract for the sale of our oil because even if they start producing in December by the time they get up to the production and the full like the oil is shipped it will be in February or so February um, and so you don't need really an agreement for the for the sale of the oil to a third part with a third party and that period you can easily say exxon well can sell for the oil for one month and you're in favor of that yes not to tie up no arrangement with the with these parties because we heard that there are lots of um lots of people who are going to pay large sums of money now right these guys to tie up a long-term arrangement. This is gonna be a, a lucrative sector. It has to go through open competitive bidding. People should bid for the price for to sell your oil. And the best deal that the country gets should be the, the ones who are the, those get the contract to do that. And this must not be scrutinized by the government alone. That's why in our oversight machine that we are putting in place, which will be in the manifesto that we plan to use civil society as part of the oversight mechanism for all of these things. So that is what we, we expect. But even now, uh, your suspicions, or well, the issues you raise that are, look suspicious, the issues you raise that look suspicious are justified. You're justified in raising the issues because even now, as we, sp as we speak, I saw a prospectus for the sale of the the cogen plant and the the wartsilla sets that we have at Skelden and the bid is supposed to close well it's a it's not an open bid it's been sent to a few individuals supposed to be closed on November 4th 
And so Nissil is busy doing all of these things. But I want to say to anybody who tags up any of these arrangements now, you know our position on this matter. It's not going to stand because it's illegal. So even now they are doing these things. And I wouldn't put it past them that we have another valiant type deal um, before the elections with the oil, the lifting of our oil. Anything else major was discussed in recent? Nothing. It's just their schedule and um, they basically the future. They 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 said they not supporting any political party in Ghana. And we made it clear we don't need your support. Um, we in fact we believe that you should have a pact that nobody, um, no none of the parties should receive money from the oil companies. It's all like yeah, we. Oh, I said this publicly. I, said, I it said it publicly. Yes, but we. I we made it clear. Not that path, but I spoke about no oh. support for any party. Um, there's. We can't allow our people. I've seen already how even people who are vocal in the sector, one little contract they get, and then from Exxon, and then suddenly they they stop speaking, and this is how sometimes the oil companies work. They will come, they will um, give you a couple of contracts, to especially the most vocal people, critics, and then they become muzzled. And that's why political parties must not become muzzled by campaign donation. We're in our manifesto, we'll also have about campaign financing laws and stuff like that, which we, we move to have that discussed. Okay, I'm over so during your meeting with ExxonMobil, were there discussions about uh, gas to power plant? Because I know that Exxon has been encountering sizable um, Sure, in the so, uh, recent discoveries, yes. more gas. Um, we have outlined our position in the public domain. We have said that we have a three-part plan. Immediately, we have to put about 50 megawatts or fossil fuel into the system to get us over the crisis because right now you are we're in bad shape we're in really really bad shape so that's almost an immediate decision and then we're hoping that they get the pipeline and the, the gas the gas power um, power plant of gas fired power plant will be up and running in about two years time and then uh, hopefully the two combined will bring in 250 megawatts which is double more than double what we are producing now and then we go for the hydro which is about another 160 megawatt so you will get up within hopefully four five years time to near over 400 megawatts of power which will be nearly three times the capacity that would allow more people to come on the grid who are privately generating now because the price would come down significantly. Um, and you have reliability, you have a lot of reserves in the system, a lot of the sets we have now will move into reserves. Um, so, so that is our plan for the sector. Um, and therefore, gas is an important part. You have to have a, a more technical, they're not moving it forward. I saw Sharma saying something like, oh, they haven't decided or something like that as yet. We you we have to we've already asked Samuel Hines to look at some issues there because Sam has an enormous amount of experience in this. And so he's been looking at with a small team of people to look at um, these issues. We'd have to put together a good technical team to move this these projects forward swiftly. Okay and just another issue. I know you spoke about your manifesto taking into consideration the plans for the oil sector. Just recently, we saw officials from Trinidad and Tobago talking about uh, the country being trapped in years of um, declining growth, and they're projecting the same for 2019. Does your plan consider ensuring Guyana does not suffer the same fate, uh, being dependent on the oil sector? Yeah, the, this is why the architecture is so vital. And the Natural Resources Fund has 
a few bodies. One is the Macroeconomic Committee. And that, although people don't pay much attention to it, it's crucial that that advisory group, that committee, works to ensure that both the sustainable level of withdrawal of funds from the Sovereign Wealth Fund, as well as the fiscally sustainable level, that they are all guided by some economics. This is what we have seen that has triggered it is the lack of macroeconomic planning, wanton use of the resources, easy access to those resources, where the state can manipulate, for example, revenue levels. If it's built around revenue, you project your revenue high, you have a shortfall, uh, uh, unrealistically high, you have a shortfall, and then that gives you the shortfall is covered by an access to the sovereign wealth fund. We've seen various models that are very loose. That's why we want an arm's length model where access to the fund is governed heavily by sound economics. So if you do that, you'd avoid what happened in Trinidad and Tobago. The Dutch disease, we've seen that it caused the destruction, the resource course that has affected most countries could be avoided and then you can direct the use of the money into activities that will promote growth, non-oil growth, non-oil growth, so that in the long run, even when the oil starts dwindling, you will still have a vibrant economy. Trinidad now is caught when a few years ago, they had an 80% reduction in their revenue because they never planned for a rainy day. I spoke with three prime ministers in Trinidad and Tobago about, in the course of my period from as president, about planning for post-oil and gas economy. But sometimes when people start getting oil money, they forget all of that. But by the way, don't think we're gonna get a lot of money between now and, and the next 20, 2025. People think all money will be flowing out over ears everywhere in the street and stuff like that. It's not so. And if you and, and even if you register, that doesn't mean you're getting a share of the oil money. Because right, as Apnu is saying now, you won't get registered for your share of the oil money. Sir Tim Hawking question I have yes, a few questions. Yes, yes, sure. Now Exxon has been sued by two of the most uh, powerful US states, New York and Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And hear me out for a moment. Yeah, sure. In, no the in the New York summons, it stated yeah, that. Can we get some more coffee? We need this. In the summons for the New York lawsuit, it stated that Exxon misrepresented the cost of climate change on its operations. And Guyana is stated as one of the countries for which they misrepresented their costs for their operations before 2016. Now, obviously, that raises questions about the massive pre contract costs that they foisted onto this country. How could we expect a PPP government to handle that if it is found to be misrepresenting its costs? And what are the implications of that for our program? Yeah. So, so what is vital is that we ensure that there are two, two impacts, the localized impact and the global impact. So the local, localized impact has to do more with oil spills, our environment, the, the issue of displacement of our fishermen, etc. The safety of our maritime area, our flora and fauna. That's local impact, localized impact. And those costs have to be fully accounted for or they have to have insurance, first of a plan to address any, any one of these environmental externalities localized one or and or secondly to um to they they have to secure insurance for it then there is also the carbon impact the global carbon impact emission impact and the risks are associated with two things basically will there be a carbon tax or a cap and trade system so that would have an externality which to the oil companies and pose a risk to them. So we have to look at all of these things, Exxon in its global 
in terms of its global impact, climate impact, and localized one. The, uh, right now, the priority should be the localized impact force. And then we have to see if in their planning numbers that they built in an environmental externality that they are not really expending, but we are compensating for that. So assuming I my costs are $10, but I estimate that you add another $2 to the for environmental um, impact, say global impact. So this is my co cost here. Yes, yeah, sure. That this is my cost here. So $12 now. But you're not paying out the $2 to anyone. It's just in your planning. But when Guyana compensates for cost oil, uh, the, to a deduction from cost oil, we are compensating for the full $12. Yeah, but the question is... So, so you, un you understand, this I understand is, that. that that's that's what we have to be care careful about. Yes, yeah, so but what the lawsuit states is that the $2 that you're saying they yes. will make a pump for, they're telling your investors that they make a pump for it, but they're not actually including it in the calculations. Mm -hmm. So why make a system like that if you're not going to represent it in your calculation? Yeah, well, well, that's why they're in trouble. So the question is about the, the, the honesty of these oil companies. Yeah, oil, oil companies try to maximize benefits to their shareholders. And not just oil companies, most companies have. That is why you need global and national regulation to have them meet by law their obligations on the environmental sector. Some countries are choosing the cap and trade system, other countries are choosing an environmental tax, and some countries don't believe in it at all. So it depends on your philosophy. And so this is, this is, but companies, most companies, underestimate it because the bottom line the money that they have available now to distribute to their shareholders is higher and based on that the dividend payout and everything else they they get a higher valuation in the market they trade their stocks go up their and shares if the, they find that, if the rulings find that they're lying what would you do i says i don't know the laws of those states but it could lead to fines or even convictions. Okay. My second question. Um, Robert Vidal and Nigel Hines in party, they launched last night. And mm -hmm. one of the major issues that they're raising is that the contract with Exxon Mobil, it must be renegotiated. And we had um, a petroleum expert, Mr. Anthony Paul. He has said that there are ways that you can convince an oil company within the confines of the, uh, the, the contract to renegotiate the contract. How, has, has your opinion or your position on this evolved today? Um, well, these, co these parties are like being launched with such a rapidity <laughs> that my head you know, spent. But, and, and often I don't know which party it is because it seems as though the same people from one party going to the other to launch, etc. So I'm a bit confused. Anyhow. I also saw that there seems to be a, a, some disagreement between Mr. Hines' position on this issue. No, they, they, no, they, they, they corrected it. What did they say actually? Well, Badal said he was misquoted, so they went to Facebook and put the correct thing. Oh, so Badal now is in favor of it? Yes. Oh, so they, what he said in their Starbuck news was not accurate. Mm. That's his All right. Opinion. Well, I'm glad you corrected it. But they. It's one thing to seek to. I don't. Want, I don't want to be unkind to any small party. But but um, it's one thing to seek uh, this as a party to get attention, a slogan, when you're busy trying to rush down these same oil companies for business, to rent properties and all of that. And then when you get a bad deal, you shake, you, you, you're unhappy with them or genuinely 
as a serious party, try to get the best out of the sector. So we made it clear the approach that you are applying for the gentleman who spoke with you yeah. is probably the best approach with the Exxon Mobil one. They already have a 2% royalty there and there are lots of other things. And we've made it clear that any other contract will be renegotiated. But not this one. That, 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 that approach, looking at the total cost, that, that's the approach we will use with Exxon. No. He's saying that in this contract, a provision allows you to go back and renegotiate the contract. I, I, I'm not sure that's the exact thing, but let me tell you my position is that I believe that the combination of stronger contract administration, reducing, checking every bit of their costs. So not just pre-contract costs, I believe we can save hundreds of millions from pre-contract costs, from the costs that they put to cost, their cost oil, their expenditure, ensuring that these are consistent with international standards, making sure that they don't, that there's no extravagance. So if we're paying for the headquarters, why the headquarters, they must be, why do we even need a headquarter? And that sort of thing, and expend large sum of money on it. That sort of thing. Rigid control of costs can bring more money. It leaves a bigger share for profit oil, and we're getting 50% of that. Mm -hmm. The cost center. The, the issue of taxation. <coughs> taxation. Do we need to give the subcontractors a blanket approval for even for duty-free concessions for things that they are bidding against Guyanese for. I don't believe that. That's discriminatory. That has something like that has to change because that's putting our people at a disadvantage. Thirdly, a strong local content policy because it's not just how much you get from the oil company. It's not just how much more end, ends up in the coffers but how many more jobs are created and how many more of our business, Guyanese business, prosper because they in turn will pay taxes. So I look at the, all of their activities and progressively increasing the share of local content as our capacity grows. So that is the approach we want to use in this case that we need to look at it swiftly and then out of that will become we we work a model PSA, mm -hmm. so it's a combination of I'm not I'm not going to give you yes no answers like some of the parties, right. I, because we have studied a lot of the elements of the contract that we have we believe more money can flow to Ghana or more opportunities can come to our people. That's our approach to them. Okay, market. and so apart from trying to convince the oil companies to renegotiate this contract, which you've now made it clear is, is off the table. Um, the contract comes up for review soon. It's actually um, late 2020. So what can we expect? Well, that? then that is when, when the review takes place, there could be changes. Anna, is there anything particular? No, no. Well, I, I can't, at a press conference, the last thing I would do would be irresponsible of me. I'll be just like these, the hopeless ones that go and talk off the top of their head, oh, they're going to do this or slogan here. Any approach to these companies have to be steered. These guys have the best lawyers in the world. They would look for everything you say, what you do, to try to use that against you. We have to have a technical approach, get the best people in the room, the best lawyers advising us, the best technical assistance and then come up with a national position on this matter. Hopefully get buy-in from, if a PPP government get buy-in from ATNU. It's that approach, but a serious type of approach where they will see, even before we go into the discussion or negotiation, the negotiating brief, to get comments on it about that. So you don't go after the fact. You try to develop the national position even before you approach the companies. This sort of thing is vital for us. And we can expect full disclosure. Right? Full, full disclosure. That's why we are arguing that we need to criminalize non-disclosure. We are arguing about criminalizing non-disclosure. Not just leave it to the goodwill of 
the president or anyone else, but it must be illegal according to our laws. Thank you.